How could it happen? A country we know well is facing the worst humanitarian crisis in living memory. Yet no one seems to care. Liz Hayes is in Pakistan, where almost a third of the country has been swamped by flood water and aid is barely trickling in. It's almost impossible to describe the magnitude of this disaster. The floodwaters here cover an area the size of England. 20 million people have been affected. That's a human toll bigger than the Haiti earthquake and the Boxing Day tsunami combined. And now disease is looming. It really couldn't get much worse. But it seems not too many people really care. From out of nowhere, they came. Flood victims crammed onto a wooden boat, forced to find their own way out of this inland sea. One crowded boat in just one corner of a country that is literally drowning. This is Pakistan right now. And for its Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Ghilani, it is a desperate sight. In fact, this is uh, one of the biggest ever disaster in, in the world histories. And uh, this is one of uh, the unprecedented disaster and uh, it has not only affected uh, one province, it's affected the whole country. So your entire country is at risk here? Yes. Nearly a third of Pakistan is underwater. Earlier this month, torrential monsoon rain sent a wall of water down the mountains, surging south, spreading out, and swallowing up Pakistan's farming heartland. It's not until you get into the air that you understand the sheer scale of this disaster. As far as the eye can see, there is water. And down there, there are hundreds of thousands of families waiting for someone, anyone, to turn up. They have lost just about everything, but what they need now is food and medicine but mostly just to get the hell out of here. Those who have escaped take refuge wherever they can. In schools, in tents by the road, and if they're lucky, in a refugee camp. But wherever they are, the expression on their faces is the same despair and bewilderment, as if they're trying to comprehend what's happened. This is how they have to now live, yes. and, which uh, they're not used to. Yes. Major Riyaz Shaheed has the overwhelming task of taking care of these people. This is your biggest camp? Yeah. Yes. yes. How many people here? Uh, 2,600. Have you seen anything like this before? No, I think uh, because in my, in my life I have never seen this. Uh, a scale of calamity in my life. We need a much more uh, bigger effort and a bigger scale to help these people, otherwise these people would suffer a lot. For months, if not years to come, places like this will be home to millions of stranded families, all of them dependent on handouts and the generosity of others. When you see uh, houses destroyed and then you see people's beds and you know the wheelchair and shoes, it makes you bring it home. Yeah. That, you know, this is where people lived and that's what's left. That's, that's just devastating, yeah. seeing somebody's wheelchair. I mean, in it. There's, no, there's no disaster in the world, whether it be an earthquake or tsunami, can do any more damage than that because it's total destruction. Bob Hanby has worked for the Australian Red Cross for 26 years. He's been to just about every major disaster zone in the world, but none come close to this one. 
I think uh, it's fair to say I'm reasonably experienced in, in dealing with these sorts of disasters, yet when I set foot on the villages uh, the first time I went out into the field and stood on the banks of the river, saw the, the village completely destroyed, um, it was something that I really didn't expect. And, and it, 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 I find it incredible that after all these years of experience, um, I was still shocked to see uh, what, what, you know, what was in front of me. This village sits on the banks of the Kabul River. That's the river we're looking at, Liz. It's a big mess, isn't it? Sure is. And when the floodwaters came, they were swift and brutal. Ultimately, we're talking about a, an inland tsunami, aren't we? I think so, and um, this has had the same effect on these villages as, as the Bandarche tsunami did, as far as I can see. Yeah, no, it's, it's devastating. Isa Khan's home has turned to mud and most of his possessions destroyed. The rest of his village has been all but swept away. Isa Khan, were you frightened? Yes, and my father at that time, that I do not think that, that he will be alive. Because that is the uh, so sudden situation at that time that uh, everything, uh, when they pass, they collapse everything. Yeah. Did, because, the did the water go as high as yes, those, the top of yes, those buildings? Yes, yes. So many homes, fragile to begin with, are gone. Now, relief workers like Bob are here to bring back to these people the basics. I'm a grandfather and what affects me is to see young children in particular who really just don't understand what's happening around them and when you know little kids walk up and hang on to you by the hand and you, and you look at where they've come from where, you know you look at their house if it's there it's full of mud where they're sleeping they're slopping around you know with no shoes on uh, they look at they look at you and say well mister you know what what are you going to do for for us you know and but realistically how long will it take for this country to recover Yes, it's, it's, I mean, it's a question that we're asking ourselves all the time. I mean, we're talking years. Homeless and penniless, people are now grappling with disease. And the suffering is almost impossible to watch. So this is our mobile clinic. Iman Katrin Keswani runs mobile medical clinics for Medicine Sans Frontier. And every day is a battle in holding back the next wave in this disaster. Have you seen cholera? This area is endemic and we know that cholera will come. Disease could be as bad as the initial destruction. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. The, many of the diseases, if we, like we talked about cholera, is, uh, it, without treatment it's 50% uh, uh, mortality. 50%? Yeah, it can be up to 50%, yeah, so without the, treatment. So uh, half the people could die if they don't get this yeah. treatment? Big job, isn't it? Yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> That's the understatement of yeah. the day. Dealing with this disaster is a massive challenge on all fronts. At Multan Military Air Base, the hub of the relief effort in the south, the heavy work is being done by only a few. Today, just two cargo helicopters are operating. And aid agencies are frustrated by a stalled international response. There is some aid getting through. We're in a Chinook with the United Arab Emirates. And for the past couple of weeks, they've been delivering food and water and general supplies to flood victims. And they're doing a great job. But you have to ask, if this is considered one of the worst natural disasters of our time, where is the rest of the world? The problem 
problem these desperate people face is that internationally their country is on the nose. Wracked by corruption and a haven for terrorists, Pakistan does not easily attract sympathy or charity. Do you accept that part of the problem is a negative perception of Pakistan? No, certainly not. You don't believe that's played no, any no, role? No, I don't believe in that because they had already supporting us. But at the same time, uh, Pakistan alone as a nation, one nation can't uh, 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 fight uh, with this menace. But uh, the whole uh, world, we need the support of the whole world. You must have some very sleepless nights. Uh, certainly, yes. So what do you say to those people who might want to give but don't because they're concerned that this is a country that supports extreme Islamic beliefs? Yeah, I mean, I can understand um, why people think that way sometimes, but um, from my point of view, you're not giving to that country or that government, you're giving it to the people that we are meeting out on the ground every day of the week when, when we're working. This crisis is still in its infancy. The water is still coming, and there are more homes and families in its way. The health and welfare of this nation is on a knife's edge. Without help, Pakistan and its people may never recover. I think the, the thing for me is that when you come face to face with somebody who's suffering so badly, it is almost impossible to turn your back. Yes, I think it is a challenge, you know, and I would defy anybody um, to walk away and say, well, you know, it's sad about that, and, but it's not, it's not my problem. I would defy people to be able to do that and sleep properly at night. How much of a difference would it have made if police acted on his phone calls? Big difference. A new witness speaks. He took off the mask. It was Christian B. Christian B. Will the truth about Maddie McCann? He said she didn't scream. Finally be revealed. The evidence we have, there's no doubt.